I am thankful for the opportunities I do have to stand up here and, and preach. Now, I know each and every one of us has done something to cause someone to be ashamed of us. And really, to cause each of us to be ashamed of ourselves. Have we ever heard from a parent, or someone else that we might look up to, after doing such things? I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. And depending on who tells us that, that might mean more than getting physically disciplined for that bad action. Because we've just disappointed someone that we've hold dear. We've let them down. Now again, I'm sure, especially the guys, we've probably heard that a bit more often. Somehow or another, we find ourselves getting into trouble pretty regularly. Maybe it's disobedience to a parent, and this was their response. Maybe we did something foolish to bring reproach on our family. Maybe we're part of an organized sport, and we let our team down. Coach might have said that. Teammates might have said that. We let our friends down. Either way, there are chances are high that we have at some point disappointed someone. Has a fellow Christian ever disappointed you? Have you ever disappointed a fellow Christian? Now the Apostle John said that he rejoiced to see his children growing in the faith. 2 John verse 4 and 3 John verses 3 and 4. Unfortunately, this cannot be said for all new Christians, those who are new in the faith, babes in Christ. For not all of them grow as they ought to. Luke chapter 8, verses 13 through 14. Sometimes problems arise that overwhelm them, and as a result, they fall away. This should be a concern to all Christians especially the older Christians. More developed Christians bear the responsibility to, these, to those who are younger. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, and Romans chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. So this morning, I would like for us to consider certain disappointments that new Christians face. First, these newborn babes in Christ could become disappointed with themselves for they recognize they have perhaps the same weaknesses as before. You see, many who become Christians, it really should be all of them, are overjoyed with anticipation. You see, they followed the pattern of salvation such as the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, verses 30 through 39. That passage reads, says, And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Esaias, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. 
And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. And the eunuch saw him no more. And the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. We have here a pattern of salvation, the pattern of salvation. This eunuch was studying the scriptures. Enoch helped, or Philip, excuse me, uh, helped him out in his studies. Preached Jesus unto him, and eventually baptism was brought up. And this eunuch wanted to be baptized. And as a result of his salvation, his forgiveness of sins, we see that he went on, went on his way rejoicing. Every newborn Christian follows this pattern in order to become a Christian. And I know I was rejoicing when I went on my way, when I had indeed received forgiveness of sins. As a result of this baptism, this new life in Christ, we are a new creature in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. However, some encounter certain issues, certain problems. They understand and they see and they realize that some of those old temptations are still present. And these temptations might even be stronger than they were before. And as such... Their discouragement builds. Luke, Luke chapter 8 verse 13. We see in the life of Paul that no doubt he was haunted by the memories of the Christians that he had murdered and put in prison. He had been responsible for the death of many of his brethren, our brethren. And he even did so with a good conscience toward God. Acts chapter 22, verses 3 and 4. In Acts chapter 23, verse 1. What can be done to help these new Christians regarding their temptation, regarding these different ways that they struggle, even though they are forgiven of their sins? What can we do to help them in their, their, their new journey as they've just begun it? Well, we must teach that the process of transformation is a continuous process. It never stops. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. There says, Mortify, or put to death, or subdue your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Transformation, the growth process, never ceases. And while the brethren in Colossae were once involved in these different sins, they were no longer. But no doubt those temptations were still there. And without the proper teaching, without following through with what they knew was right, they would easily fall back into these old habits and succumb to their temptations. We must also teach that God is ever willing to forgive. We must also point out that God is ever willing to provide strength for his children. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. And Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, which reads, 
Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now, which is more in, in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Secondly, these new Christians might become disappointed with their brethren, their fellow Christians. These, Christ, these new Christians might witness certain inconsistencies in the lives of their brethren. Some may speak highly of the Bible, of its teachings, yet unfortunately do not follow those teachings. This comes in the form of perhaps strong teaching. However, they engage in fellowshipping those who they ought not. They might engage in sinful behavior such as adultery or even the use of foul language, and on and on the list can go. Many preachers have fallen victim to this form of hypocrisy. They might preach God's will on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, but they themselves are living in adultery. And again, on and on the list can go, and unfortunately has gone. Some may barely even attend worship service, services of the saints. Some brethren only appear when it is convenient. Now, this is getting close to being fall time. Well, maybe not fall, but fall time. Because this is Texas. And being in Texas, there's a whole host of folks whose religion is football whether it be high school, college, or professional. So you'll have folks that are willing to sit out in the bleachers for three hours, but can't seem to handle sitting in a pew for one hour. Whether they claim to be a Christian or not, their religion is football, or at least contains football. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going to a football game. But you're going to a football game or some other organized event in place of going to worship with the saints. Christians see that. Babes in Christ see that. That is disappointing. You see, these folks are so entrenched in worldly activities that they set aside no time for worshiping God. Sunday is not the only time you're a Christian. There's six other days of the week. And we're expected to put on Christ to live out his gospel every day that we draw breath. And not just Sunday mornings. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 23 through 25 still says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love. And to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. To forsake such gatherings, the text specifically is talking about gatherings for worship, these assemblies of the church that are meant to worship God, to forsake those is to desert the brethren. There is no place for a coward in the Lord's army, whether it's with respect to worship or attacking and defeating error. One cannot provoke others unto love and good works if they're not here. Likewise, we cannot provoke you unto good works and love if you are absent. It's a two-way street. We are all expected to follow this commandment. Yet there are some who are already forsaking, as we read in verse 25. People were already forsaking, deserting their brethren at the time that this was written. So it is written to exhort those that are faithful to continue being faithful, to set the example. It can be and is quite painful when members forsake their brethren. This is especially true when brethren leave the faith altogether. 
those who have followed the example of Demas. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, For he loved the present world more than he loved the church. The biggest example of inconsistency would occur in the home. You see, one or both parents might be Christians. However, they perhaps don't live accordingly. Kids pick up on those things. Kids realize and know more than we give them credit for. They're able to compare and contrast. Well, mom and daddy, you say this. You say this is what the Bible says. But this is what you're doing. Make it make sense. Mom and daddy, why are you not doing what you're telling me to do? Why are we not gathering with the, the other Christians on Sunday? Why are we doing this and not this? The list can go on. Are these parents setting a good example to their children? The home as God would have it is where education must begin. It's good to have Bible classes. It's good to have some form of public ideological education. But God intended the home to be where all that begins. Bible classes are not the main source of Bible information for your children. Mom and daddy should be the ones presenting that at home. The Bible classes as we typically hold are supplements. Like with feeding cows, you have the pasture with all the grass. Periodically you might throw out some range cubes and you might have some salt lick. Salt block, some mineral block, that's not all you give them. It's meant as a supplement to help in their normal diet. Unfortunately, many families rely on Bible classes and assembly of the saints to be the main sustenance for not only themselves, but that of their children. That, not ought, that ought not be the case. We must be the good example to our children that God expects us to be. And I'm not taking myself out of that. I've got to be the good example to my two children. I can't do that if I'm not living right myself. Babes in Christ, new Christians, might become disappointed with ill treatment. This may even occur in Bible classes, men's business meetings, Workplace where there are multiple Christians present, and even times of recreation or play. They might be treated improperly. Harsh words can be devastating to these new Christians. Now, I'm not talking about proper discipline, biblical discipline. Sometimes harsh words need to be stated. But what I'm getting at is there's a, there's a set of words and actions that go beyond that. Instead, this is a mean-spirited approach. And such an approach can and even has stunted the growth of many Christians, those who are new in the faith. It often shatters their confidence, not only in themselves, but also in their brethren. This sort of thing, unfortunately, is not new. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? You see, Peter had played the part of a hypocrite. 
And his example caused others to stumble, including Barnabas. Thankfully, Paul was there to withstand him to the face. This sort of thing goes on today as well. We must be able to stand up against such error, even if it means confronting our own brethren. Now, what can be done to help in these situations? Those who are older in the faith must be the good example that they're expected to be. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. It's not a competition, but we need to be doing our best at being good. Not only by doing what is right and good, but also admitting when we have done wrong, when we have sinned. We must teach and we must realize that Christians, both young and old, are following this same process of transformation. As Christians, we must realize that we are, in fact, in this together. Not like the slogan that came out a few years ago when you have a separate class saying that we're in this together because of COVID while well, they're in their mansions. But as Christians, we are in the body of the saved. We, are, we make up that body. And we ought to be there for one another to help each other along. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 14. But what things were gained to me, those I count, counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law of Moses, but that which is through the, law, the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus." Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Again, that's Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 14. Paul was going, uh, going through this transformation, continuous process of improvement, We have his example to follow for us today. We must keep the proper perspective as we live here and serve God. <clears throat> Third, newer Christians can become disappointed by the world. And this comes in the form of trials and tribulations, temptations. You see, they may get entangled by worldly responsibilities. Things such as a job, the family, the ties that are associated with them, even hobbies, different recreation forms. Those things that are not inherently sinful, these would be categorized as the weight that besets us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. These things, not held in their proper place, can choke new Christians out to the point of unfruitfulness. Luke chapter 8, verse 14. Such ties can become sinful. James chapter 1, verses 12 through 16 reads, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised them to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, Neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. 
Disappointment can also come from unconverted friends. Folks that we have built up a strong relationship with, including co-workers, typically they'll want to spend time with us as they did before. This could be co-workers that we've known for quite a long time, folks that we know outside of work, outside of the church, that we do have strong ties with. But increasingly so, this type of individual will not understand your new life as a Christian, nor will they understand your obligations. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 4 says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For, thee that, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh, to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, the friends that we have, once we realize that we have an obligation to Christ and to con control ourselves, to be obedient to his gospel, the friends that we have, our running buddies as it might be, they're going to expect us to, con to be present with them while they perform this same excess of riot. And then when we tell them, no, we're not going to partake in that, they'll begin speaking evil of us, to persecute us. The Holy Spirit by Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 33 and 34, says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Eventually, we will become like those we spend most of our time with. This is important to, be, to realize and to be concerned about. Thus, we must be careful with who we share our time with. This starts carrying over into those we choose to date and eventually those who we choose to marry. You're never going to marry somebody you do not date. What kind of an individual are we seeking to spend a life with here on earth? Are they going to drag us down or build us up? What kind of friends are we going to build ties with? Same question. Are they going to build us up or tear us down? The world can only pull us down. For the world has not much to offer us as Christians. Now what can we do to help with such matters? Those who are older in the faith must demonstrate Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. We must show what it means to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Our example should show what it means to put Him first in our lives. While jobs are important, while recreation is important, and while family is important, none of these eclipse the importance of following Christ. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15-17. We might help by developing strong relationships with these babes in Christ. You see, these friendships, by the very nature of them, would be Christ-centered. They wouldn't focus on the different social needs, although they would help with them. But more importantly, they would be tending to the spiritual needs. This would provide a way for us to edify one another. Romans chapter 14, verse 9 Chapter 15, verse 2. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. And 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4. Christians make up the body of Christ. We should be edifying one another. We should make up the network of the saved. 
We talk about networking. We're talking about maybe getting a job and building relationships with worldly folks. Christians are a network. We need to make ourselves known to one another. We need to take up that opportunity we have to network with one another. Fourth and final, these new Christians might be disappointed by seeming lack of success. Young Christians may think that all of their problems will go away simply by obeying the gospel. Unfortunately, this denominational concept of the gospel of health and wealth has permeated much of our society. And obviously with that, the church. However, this is not what the Bible teaches. In fact, we see the direct opposite. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when, not if, but when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Consider also 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Temptations and trials are a daily difficulty for all Christians, not just those who are new in the faith. Because of this fact, we must be willing and able to rise to the occasion to meet such challenges. We can help with such adversity in the following ways. First off, what kind of example do we have? Well, we're told in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 13, that we will suffer persecution. And it will come because we're living a righteous life. Because we are now giving our life over to the will of Christ. Similar sentiments are found to be preached in other churches. Acts chapter 14, verses 21 through 23. The churches of Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch were, were, um, received teaching to be prepared for such things. Persecution, temptations, and trials. They were exhorted to continue in the faith to be strong in doing so. It seems that as we grow, the stronger these trials become. We must continue to rise to each challenge. Never forget that being a Christian is a life of continual growth. We've already mentioned that a couple times. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. We all started out as babes in Christ. But we're expected to grow. We're expected to be able to become teachers. To be able to consume stronger meat. To move on from the milk of the word. And we're expected to be able to use our senses to discern good and evil. The brethren listed in this passage were not able to do that. Because they had not chosen the path of growth. Now to be forewarned is to be forearmed. The better prepared that we are for our adversary requires that we know what to expect. We must not be ignorant of Satan's devices. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. We must put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 5 or 6, verses 10 through 18. And we must realize that our adversary, the devil, actively seeks our destruction. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. Now we must be concerned about quality over quantity. We see in the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 13 through 18, where Elijah in his depression, depressive state was concerned and heartbroken, distraught over the fact that he thought he was alone in faithfulness to God. While he does, in fact, appear to be alone against Israel, there was a faithful remnant. This account is also referenced in Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. When the invading king of Syria surrounded their city, Elisha's servant was fearful. Then we see in, throughout this passage of 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 18, Elisha prayed to God that God would open the eyes of his servant. 
And upon doing so, this servant saw God's army. Now it often seems that we fail by not converting the entire world to the gospel of Christ. And it can be overwhelming with this fact. We feel like failures. We feel like we're alone. But we must never forget that there is a faithful remnant. Even if that remnant is you. We owe it to God to remain steadfast in our service to Him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Remember, Jesus was not able to convert the entire world. He was not even able to convert all whom He taught. Did our Savior fail? Absolutely not. He promised to build His church, and He did so. His mission was to do God's will. His mission was to build the church. And he succeeded in both. Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 and Acts chapter 2 verse 47. We cannot expect to do better than Jesus. They hated him. The world's going to hate us. What we must do is do the best we can where we're at with what we have to do. And in that, we will be faithful, we will be successful. Quality over quantity. Some folks attempt to get our numbers up by sacrificing the quality of those numbers. As we've considered this morning, there are many disappointments that those who are new in Christ must and have faced. Consider the following stages which the Christian typically goes through. You have what could be called the fire stage. This is a period of time following their conversion to Christ where they're extremely enthusiastic. They're on fire for the Lord. But then you enter into the reality stage and that fire starts to go out a little bit, falter, disappointment set in. And then they realize there are ups and downs in this life in the flesh. And through this period, this stage, they will either grow or they will fall away. And then you have the persevering stage. The point in every Christian's life, if they persevere, this growth remains steady. It remains progressive. To reach this stage, we must realize that disappointment will come. It's not optional. We must then prepare accordingly. We must rely on our brethren for this help. And we must, as brethren, be reliable to give such help. We must be the brethren that show forth a good example. And we must never allow our faith to be in man, even our own brethren. Paul had to deal with false brethren, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. Judas betrayed Jesus. Would either of these men been successful had their faith rested in men? Of course not. If Jesus' faith rested in Judas, well, Judas forsook him. Judas for betrayed Jesus. Where did their faith lie? Their faith was in God, just as ours must be today. We have shown what must one or what one must do in order to be saved, to receive salvation from their sins. If you wish to obey the gospel, why not do so this morning? Render obedience to the gospel of Christ, ultimately resulting in your baptism. Now these words were not the words, are not the words of mere mortals. These are the words of God. Will you obey them today? Now if you have been a disappointment to your brethren, ultimately to God, and as a Christian, as a child of God, you've allowed this to overtake your life, why not put those things away? Be restored as a faithful member of the church. If either of these apply to you, please come now as together we stand and sing.